Father God, we just thank you that as we meet this morning, we meet that God of love. Lord, we thank you for that love so freely given, so freely offered for us all. And we pray, Lord, as we continue in worship, we may meet that love and we may be transformed by it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to our service this morning. And I hope you agree with me that over this last few days, there's been a real sort of sense of the world coming alive as we've had some lovely sunshine and the, the spring flowers are starting to show themselves. And I, I really hope that um, we're feeling encouraged, especially with the news on Monday, that we can begin to move forward out of the lockdown and maybe new life will be something that we can experience in the weeks and the months to come. So praise God for that good news and let's pray that that roadmap will continue to move forward in a positive way. So let's just be quiet for a moment as we continue to enter God's presence and give him thanks for all that is good. Do you see the city? Here God dwells among the people. God will make a home among us, and we shall be God's people. God is the beginning and the end, and is making the whole creation new. Let us worship together. And we worship by singing the hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
As God makes this new creation, he makes us pure and holy, something that we can only achieve through his love and his grace. And so we come before him in sorrow for our sins. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from sin and turn to the Lord, confessing our sins in penitence and in faith. And so we just pause for a moment to reflect on those things that spoil God's image in us. In penitence and faith, we come before you, holy God, and say, this is who we are. We are the people who long for a new heaven and a new earth but can't always take the first step towards it. Forgive us, gracious Lord. We are those who love the city, but participate in its destructive patterns of life and fail to live up to its beauty and creativity. Forgive us, gracious Lord. We are the people who commit ourselves to build up the community of the gospel, but we so often betray that hope and fail each other. Forgive us, gracious God. We are those who sometimes see the vision for our own lives, but we are weak and fall short of the dream. Forgive us, gracious God. And so as we come before God, we are assured of his forgiveness. In Jesus, may we always announce that now is the time of the new heaven and the new earth. The old order has passed away and the new creation is before us and within us. Thanks be to God. O loving Christ, hanged on a tree, yet risen in the morning, scatter the sin from our souls as the mist from the hills. And so as we've put our trust in God, to forgive us our sins and renew a right relationship with him. Let's declare our faith together. Let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And so as we continue, we worship my Jesus, my Saviour.
collect for today. Almighty God, by the prayer and discipline of Lent, may we enter into the mystery of Christ's suffering and by following in his way, come to share in his glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Continuing our reading through the book of Revelation, and today our reading is Revelation 3, verses 1 to 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, be, will like them be dressed in white. 
I will never blot out the names of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello everyone, hope you're all well as we continue in our book of Revelation. I feel like, uh, I I do feel like I should tell you all to get your history textbooks out. History textbooks out, turn to page uh, 24 and uh, we'll carry on. We're going to be going to Sardis now, it's our our next letter and we are coming towards the end of the letter and then, uh, wow, you'll have to hold on to your seats, but these are still continuing um, and they're, they're still, I hope you remember right at the beginning, we talked about how the book of Revelation is a bit like um, political cartoons. And if you want to understand them, you need to understand what was going on at the time. You need to understand the various uh, biblical references that are there um, and the symbols that are around in that culture to make sense of it. And as we've gone through the letters, you'll see how right that is, how that, that works itself out. And today we get to the letter from Sardis. Um, I don't know if you can see that on the map. We've been working our way around. Um, Sardis was an incredibly important um, city, just like a lot of them are. There's no coincidence that uh, when the first Christians went out, when people like Paul the Apostle and others went out and started planting churches, they planted in the big cities because that's how you influence. If you want to start somewhere, you start in the city and it bleeds out from there, as it were. Um, And Sardis was an incredibly important city. It was um, a place where they spun wool um, very, very early on. They were also the very first place to mint coins, um, uh, about 700 BC. I mean, in fact, they found um, gold there, and that's how the city sprang up, as it were. And by even 650 BC, it was... Um, the centre for the whole of that region of finances. It was, it was um, kind of the Wall Street, I suppose, of its day. It was an incredibly rich, powerful, influential city when you go back to about 700, 600 BC, which is long before our time, of course, in the book of Revelation. And at that time, it was um, run by um, King um, Sirius, um, sorry, Croesus. Croesus was um, an incredible. He had an incredible reputation even long afterwards because he was renowned for being powerful. He was renowned for being rich. He was um, known as being the richest person in the world at the time. An incredibly influential and powerful person. And his headquarters, his capital city, was Sardis. And Sardis was actually built on on two levels. I'll show you, this is the top here. A lot of it was in uh, the bottom of the mountain, but at the top of the mountain, he built this huge, impenetrable fortress. And it was known for being completely unconquerable. He'd poured out so much wealth. He had a huge army there. And it had, in, in a, you know, you kind of 600 BC, this reputation for being the most unconquerable um, city in the world. Um, and no one could beat it. And so this, this rich, powerful king sat in his unconquerable tower in Sardis. And that's the reputation it had back in those days. But that reputation changed. And it changed in about, for two reasons, well, for one reason, that happened twice. (laughs) It happened in about 500, well, 546, some will say 547. When you go about that far, nailing down the years can be a bit tricky. But um, King Sirius came um, from the Persian Empire and he wanted to conquer Sardis. And all the people retreated into the castle, the impenetrable castle on the top of the hill. And of course, when they got there, they found they couldn't beat it. They couldn't um, conquer this city. 
And so they camped out and they were start, trying to starve, if you like, the people inside the impenetrable city out. But uh, there were so many food stores and stuff in there, they'd been waiting a very long time. And so they wondered what to do. Now, it so happened that um, there were soldiers parading around the walls, as you can expect, and they were very complacent, very happy. And one of the soldiers um, one day was sitting on the wall and his helmet fell off and it fell down the side of the wall. And of course, he knew he'd get in trouble for losing his helmet. So he went down and he snuck out of a secret door and went to the bottom, grabbed his helmet and then went back in through this secret door. And he did this while being watched by King Sirius's watchers. And so suddenly they knew where the secret door was. And so King Cyrus went round the other side of the city with all his soldiers, away from the secret door, and bombarded them. All the soldiers ran to take on the attack that was going on in the city. And meanwhile, his secret forces went round the back, went through the secret door that they had found, and ransacked the city. And they conquered, and they won. And so this unconquerable city was conquered. <laughs> a bit later, a, a few hundred years later, a similar thing happened. Um, where again, um, they came to overtake the city and um, they couldn't do it. And they were watching and they realized that birds used to gather on the walls. And there was one particular patch of wool, where um, when people died, they used to, because they were being um, ransacked again, you know, the, the soldiers were guarding around it. And so when people died in the city, they used to throw them over the wall. And these, these piles of dead bodies gathered up at this particular area. And vultures would come and perch. And they realized that in one particular spot on the wall, these vultures were gathering there and they weren't dispersing because no soldiers were parading around that area because they didn't want the smell of all the dead bodies. And they realized this and so they attacked from that gate and again won. And so twice this so-called unconquerable city had been beaten. And so it got this reputation, instead of being unconquerable, it got a reputation for being complacent. For thinking that they were unconquerable, for thinking that nothing could happen to them. And yet, twice they were defeated. In their complacency, they were brought down. And so by the time you get to um, the time of the book of Revelation being written, the reputation for Sardis wasn't anymore a reputation for being powerful. It was a reputation of being complacent and therefore being beaten in it, of kind of sleepwalking and therefore not noticing what was going on. Now, if we read the beginning of Revelation, here we go, uh, chapter 3. To the angel of the church of Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. That again is an echo from Revelation chapter 1. I know, the, your, I know the deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. I hope you see what, what Jesus is saying here, or what John is saying, or what Jesus is saying through John, however you want to word it. He's saying your city was a city that was sleepwalked it wasn't awake and so it missed everything it was complacent and you Christians in Sardis run the risk of being the same wake up and see what's going on that's that's uh, the passage it then finishes and I'm going to come back to this uh, this slide I've changed my mind this is the trouble when you 
Anyway, don't worry about it. Um, a couple of other things. This is uh, the goddess uh, Kibla, as she was called then, the same goddess that we encountered before in Philadelphia, uh, the goddess Artemis. Different names, same one. Uh, the, the so-called many-breasted one, family show. I love that joke, sorry. I keep doing it. Anyway, um, the, <laughs> during the worship of uh, Kibla, you'd wear white robes, you'd parade, and once a year there was a big festival for her. We have covered this, sorry. And um, it would end in some of the men who really wanted to demonstrate their devotion in castrating themselves, and so these white robes would be made a huge mess, um, shall we say in the worship of Artemis. Another thing that's worth bearing in mind is that Sardis was the place where the royal archive was kept in that region. And in this archive, there would be a list of all the Roman citizens in the area. And being a Roman citizen gave you certain rights um, and certain privileges that you wouldn't get if you weren't a Roman citizen. Of course, if you did something wrong or if you angered the Caesar, your name could be crossed off that list and you would no longer be a Roman citizen. And Sardis was the place where, in that region, there was more than one place, but in the region of Asia Minor, what we'd call Turkey, this is where the archives were kept. I mention that because when we get on to the end of the letter, it says this. Yet I have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed In white, I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I hope already as you read that, alarm bells are going off. You know what's being said there. Um, He says the reward, the reward is that those who walk with me will be dressed with white robes that won't be soiled because I'm not the kind of god or goddess that demands that kind of thing. And instead, you'll parade with me and you'll be pure and holy. And your name may not be written in the Roman archive, but it is written in the book of life. You may not be a, a citizen of Rome, but you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And your name will never be crossed off. And that reward goes to those people who have not fallen asleep who have not woken up, who have not become complacent. And that's actually the whole thrust of this this letter. Are you complacent? Have you fallen asleep or do you need to wake up? Do you need to wake up to what God is doing? Do Do we collectively need to wake up to what God is doing? It is something that I think is a real challenge for all of us. It's certainly for me. Um... It becomes very easy to become, what's the word, routine in your faith. Or it does for me. I mean, I hope I'm not the only one. (laughs) But for me, it becomes so easy. Even this last week, um, but the last couple of weeks, I remember, for example, I won't go into details, but... um, Kathy will know what I'm talking about. A job came in for a, a minister, and I, um, anyway, um, for various reasons, I asked Kathy to do it, and Kathy went and did it. And then for ages, I was feeling guilty that I'd asked Kathy to do this job, um, and felt that really I, I should I should have done it myself. And it was family reasons, but the family reasons turned out not to really be true. Anyway, it's all vague without going into it properly. Um, but I remember. I was feeling really, really guilty um, about this. And um, I was was praying about it. And I almost felt, I, I felt like God was saying to me, David, did it ever occur to you that I didn't want you to do it? I wanted Kathy to do it. And it was really like God gave me a good old kick up the, whatever you want to call it, of God reminding me, do you know what, David, you're, you're, you're not all that, and Kathy was the right person for this job. Not you. Kathy. And this is the kind of thing that happens all the time. If you're, if you, and I'm not claiming I always hear, but the point is, am I awake to hearing? 
because God does do these. There was another one I got, again, I won't go into details, and I'm sorry if these stories are vague, but you know, this is the parish we live in and you know it, so I don't want to kind of <laughs> be, be more concrete in these things. Um, but I got some feedback the other day um, that wasn't, um, it wasn't particularly flattering, shall we say. Um, Before I came to St. Catherine's and St. Andrew's, I um, wasn't in charge. I was the curate in a place, Um, the same job that Andrew has here. Um, And so I always knew someone else was was the boss, and I supported them. He was a fantastic vicar. His name's Philip. Um, I've got nothing but praise for him. He's a a great guy and a good friend. Um, And before that, of course, I wasn't ordained. I I was an ordinand. I was training. And before that, I was a member of the congregation. Um, and so when I came here, I was very aware that um, I, didn't, I, I didn't know everything that I was supposed to do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I was figuring it out. I was um, uh, humbly trying to listen to God and, and lead the church in the best way I could. And In the last week when I got this feedback, I suddenly realized that I've been leading um, these churches now for about four and a half years. Um, And it's not that I'd become complacent, it's that I'd been, how can I put it, I, I kind of started to feel like I knew how this worked. Does that make sense? And then all of a sudden I got this feedback and it was like God kind of, Reminding me, David, you, only, you can only do this with me. You can only lead this place with me. Um, God's given me a right good kicking over the last couple of weeks, and that's fair enough. Sometimes you need a right good kicking. There are other, don't worry, it's not always like that. <laughs> don't, don't think I'm constantly down on myself. I'm just giving up-to-date examples. Where it really did feel like God was kind of telling me, David, you... How can I put it? Some, sometimes people very nicely, and I need the encouragement, please don't, you know, sometimes people very nicely tell me that, uh, you know, oh, you're good at stuff, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And actually, it's like God was going, don't believe the hype, you can only do stuff with me, David. You're not all that, only I'm all that. And that's, fair. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> only you're all that, God. And the minute I stop relying on him is the minute I've failed. And I think I'd run the risk of stopping to rely on him and starting to rely on myself. And God was waking me up and going, no, you need to come back to me. Because it's only in me and my strength that you'll ever be able to manage this. Now that won't necessarily be the message that he has for you. It may be all sorts of messages it has for you, but one thing I do know is that God is always wanting to speak to his children. And if we're not careful, we will simply start living a Christian life where we sleepwalk through it. Where we constant, we just, we've, we've been a Christian, you know, I've been a Christian for what, 26 years? God, blimey, that's scary. Um, And (laughs) I mean, for 26 years, it becomes very, very easy to just, you know, I know how the Christian life works and just go through the motions. But that's not actually the Christian life. And I believe that when Jesus turns up at Sardis and goes, wake up and notice what I'm doing. Don't be complacent. Otherwise, I will come and you won't notice. I'll come like a a thief in the night and you won't even notice that I'm turning up. Instead, wake up and see what I'm doing. And I think he can say that. You know, when he says it's a sardis, he says it to us. Wake up. Notice what I'm doing in your life. See what I'm trying to say to you. It should always be new. It should always be fresh. It should always be, it it shouldn't be something that you just sleepwalk through. And this is something that I think is true for us individually. But I think it's also true more than ever for the church corporately. Um, it, it's become cliche to say, but this has become so... We're about to enter. In a couple of weeks, we'll be going through our second Holy Week where we can't meet. 
The church has been closed. The church is closed because of coronavirus. What is God trying to... Do you think God's just, you know, take, while we've been closed, do you think God's stopped for a rest for a while? Well, I mean, God is still working. God is still speaking to his people. And, and while um, I would never suggest that God has brought this virus about for a second, I do believe that God will use it. What is God speaking to the church? And I mean the church in both its universal sense Um, to include all our brothers and sisters from from Pentecost to Catholics to Orthodox, to include all of them. And I mean the Church of England, and I mean St. Catharines and St. Andrews. What is God trying to teach us during this time? What is he asking us to wake up to? Here's Here's just a few that when I was preparing this kind of popped into my head, what is God trying to say to us? And I'm not saying these are the answers or an exclusive list. I'm not. I'm just kind of spitballing ideas, if you see what I mean, of what maybe God is saying. First of all, what about our buildings? Maybe he's trying to wake us up to, you know, for a long time, a lot of you will have been told the church is not the building, it's the people. That's true. But if we haven't learned it in a new way during this last year, maybe we haven't been paying attention at all. What, what does it mean that our church buildings may be closed, but St. Catherine's and St. Andrew's Church isn't because we're still here? We're still God's people, united as one family, even if we can't meet. What does that mean? And how do we go about being church when we can't meet? Maybe God is trying to tell us something for the future maybe he's trying to teach us something that we need to take forward maybe he's trying me or maybe it's literally wake up you are the church even if you can't meet and even if the buildings are closed what does what does that mean um that what, what else maybe he's trying to teach us something about money um i've had a few people you know some people are um have lost jobs and, and money's really, really hard for them. And I, my heart goes out for you, but are you still here? Are you still breathing? Do you, do you still have a roof over your head? You've still apparently been able to watch this. Maybe you didn't need that money as much as you thought you did. Or maybe you're... I'm not, I'm, again, I'm, my, I'm not kind of downplaying it or pretending it's not serious. Please don't misunderstand me. But maybe God's saying, trust me. Or for others of us, do you know what? Our income has stayed the same and all of a sudden we're realising that we, apparently we didn't have to buy new clothes all the time. Apparently we didn't need haircuts every six weeks. Apparently we can cope fine without paying to go out for nice meals. Apparently, our life just, we don't need it as much as we thought we did. And that's not to say that we don't miss it. Of course we do. Man, I'd love to go out for a meal with my family. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? I'd love to go on a holiday. But apparently, I can go for a year without it and still be standing. Maybe this relentless drive that we've been bombarded with for years that true happiness is always one purchase away maybe God's trying to wake us up to the fact that do you know what that's really not true maybe maybe it's about um relationships you know we always say that our family are most important well you know if you if you haven't learned that over this year again you're not paying attention I always, always valued my mum. Um, but man alive, after over a year of not seeing her, you know, properly, I mean, I've seen her on screen, obviously, if I haven't learned how important she is to me, then I'm really not paying attention, am I? And I'm sure that's true for all sorts of you. Um, what about the common good? Do you know, there's... May, I hope we've learned, you know, we, we, during the first lockdown, we used to go out and applaud um, key workers in the NHS. Remember that? Maybe valuing 
people like that ahead of footballers. I hope we can hang on to something like that. Maybe something about working for the common good. Maybe we can take that into the future. Um, These are, again, just ideas. The point is, are we awake and listening? Are we trying to hear what God is saying to us during this year? And when we, because I honestly think that if we come out of this, and it's a temptation for all of us, it's a temptation for me, um, it's a temptation for each and every one of us, but if we just revert back into what we've always done, I think we'll have failed to listen. I actually think that this is an opportunity for all of us, individually, as a church, as a nation, even as a world, to wake up and hopefully take new things into the future with us. You know, as a world, we've got to work together to, to defeat this virus. Can we work together to change climate change, for example? Because it's only in working together we'll be able to do it. And so I I do just finish with those questions. Oh, oh, what am I doing here? There. Are you awake? In your own life, first of all, are you awake? Or have you become complacent like Sardis? Are you like the soldier who falls asleep and drops his helmet over the wall? Or are you awake to what God's doing? Do you actually listen? Or has your Christian faith become routine? What is God doing? Are you awake? And that's in in good times and bad. Are you listening? Are you willing to take the times when God says good things to you and indeed when he says bad things to you? Are you awake? And lastly, I'd like to ask, are we awake? Yes, of course, the nation and and everything else, but St. Andrew, St. Catherine's, what is God saying to us as his people in this place at this time? How, when we go back, to worship, do we make sure that we're not going back at all, but going forward? How do we make sure that we come out of this having learnt the lessons that God wants to teach us? How do we make sure that St. Catherine's after COVID is different from St. Catherine's before COVID? How do we make sure that St. Andrew's after COVID is different from St. Andrew's before COVID? How do we make sure we've learnt the lessons that God wants to teach us? And so I'll finish with the words of Jesus. Wake up. Let's pray. Lord God, we're sorry for the times when we have become complacent. We're sorry for the ways that our faith becomes routine and normal. And we pray, Lord, that you would wake us up. Help us to hear what you are saying to us. As you repeatedly said throughout the letters, he who is an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, as your church, individually and corporately. We pray that you would give us open ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us. In your name we pray. Amen. going to um, have another time of worship as we just think of our responsibility to be awake because 
this is the time for our church to arise and proclaim Jesus in the world and proclaim that his kingdom comes on earth as in heaven. So let's come before our God and bring to him those things that are on our hearts and on our minds. And let's pray that he will wake us up, that we will be able to hear what he is saying to us and see his work in our world and in our lives. So as we pray... Lord God, please make us ready and willing to do your will. And we pray for your church. And we pray that all our brothers and sisters, those people who worship in different churches, 
in different denominations, we pray that we will be united in your truth and that we will live together in your love and that we will show your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord our God, we pray that you will wake us up to those ways of living that honour you and your purposes. Make us ready to seek out real justice. Help us to be peacemakers and peacekeepers. And help us to respect you and our neighbours. Wake us up to the best ways to serve the best interests of all people and your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord our God, we pray that we might be awake to the issues that spoil the world that you have created. Teach us to use our understanding to avoid pollution, climate change, and the waste that makes others poor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as you have made us more aware of the value of our family and friends, especially as we've missed them over the past months, we pray that you will help us to love them in the way that you do, and help us to be ready to serve both family member, friend and stranger for Jesus' sake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, open our eyes, our ears and our hearts so that we might be aware of the needs of others. We pray for those who are anxious at this time as lockdown is eased, but when there is still so much uncertainty. Help us to have understanding towards those who have different issues to deal with. Those who are anxious about their businesses, those who work in those sectors who cannot return to work until later in the process. We pray for children returning to schools and teachers and staff planning for their return. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord our God, we pray for those who are ill in body, mind or spirit. We pray that they will be aware of your presence with them and we pray that you will give them courage and hope in their troubles and that you will bring them the joy of your salvation. And as we pray this morning, we bring to mind those people on our hearts and minds who are facing difficult times at the moment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, as we look to you as our King, Help us to understand more about living as your people. Help us to be obedient and ready for serving, waiting for your return. Merciful Father, hear, accept our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. David, have we any announcements? Uh, not a lot to say. Um, hopefully you've all received your packs um, this week. Um, in light of the announcement that was made on Monday, we've been looking at when we're going to uh, reopen church. And unfortunately, it does look like um, we, we're going to not be open for Holy Week for the second year in a row, which is very disappointing. But it's the best way to keep us all safe. So we'll be announcing in the next week or two what will be, because there'll be online provision for Holy Week. Um, so we'll be announcing that coming up, but we're waiting to see what the announcement was. Um, we are at the moment looking at opening at the second phase, which will be in April. But again, the government will be waiting to review how the various lifting from lockdown go. So we'll, um, that's the plan at the moment and we'll keep you posted um, as that progresses because we want to make sure it's all done safely. Um, other than that, I don't think there's much else to say. So I'll hand back over to Cathy. <laughs> So we come to the end of our service and our blessing and sending out. Draw your church together, O God, into one great company of disciples, together following our Lord Jesus Christ into every walk of life, together serving him in his mission to the world and together witnessing to his love and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and all those who you love, care, and pray for this day and always. Amen. And as we go, we go into the world to walk in God's light, to rejoice in God's love, and to reflect God's glory. God bless and we'll be here next week. <laughs>